During my usual drives, I often enter the car without a key using keyless entry, and with just a push of a button, I can start the engine and drive away. At such times, I wonder if taking off with an aircraft is as simple as driving a car. If you have the same question, then in this video, we will take a look at how to start an aircraft using a key in the history of human aviation. For those who have flown aircraft before, upon hearing the mention of a key, they would probably smile knowingly. That's because some small civilian aircraft do indeed require a key to start, mainly to save costs. For example, the Cessna 172 is one such aircraft that requires a key. Taking this aircraft as an example, it typically has two locks. The first lock is for the door, while the other lock is for starting the engine. The engine startup procedure is similar to that of a car. After completing all the necessary preparation steps for a cold start, the final step is to turn the key to start the engine, causing the aircraft propeller to spin. However, this method of using a key to start the engine is mainly used in piston-powered propeller-driven civilian aircraft like the Cessna. In larger jet-powered commercial aircraft, there is usually no lock for the starting device. Starting a jet aircraft is often a complex process that requires a series of cold start checks. Additionally, a range of auxiliary vehicles, such as ground power units, tow tractors, and air source units, are needed to assist with pre-flight preparations. Moreover, large commercial aircraft generally do not have locks on the cabin doors. The mechanical locking mechanisms, whether operated from inside or outside the cabin, can be easily opened. This is understandable since commercial aircraft need to accommodate passengers and there is no need to lock out outsiders from the cabin. Furthermore, commercial aircraft typically have a significant distance from the ground and passengers often require boarding bridges or mobile stairs to reach the cabin doors. Therefore, the cockpit door of a commercial aircraft is the only door that requires locks and keys to keep outsiders out. Now let's shift our focus back to military aircraft. In the beginning, military aircraft did have keys, but they were quite different from what you might imagine. The key was actually the aircraft engine starting handle, similar to what you would find in early cars, tanks, and even tractors. By using external force to rotate the handle, the engine would start. Besides using the handle to start the engine through inertia, the engine could also be started by rotating the propeller shaft. This led someone to think, since they're both engines, why not use one engine to start another? As a result, ground crew members installed a set of toothed clutches on the transmission mechanism of a vehicle. They attached a chain to the clutches, and the other end of the chain was connected to a drive shaft. When the aircraft needed to start, they aligned the drive shaft with the aircraft propeller, put the vehicle in neutral, and stepped on the accelerator. The drive shaft would then rotate driving the aircraft propeller to spin. Once the speed reached a certain value, the engine could be started. This type of starter, which used automotive power and a drive shaft, was called the Huck Starter. During World War II, aviation engine technology experienced explosive growth, with engines boasting several dozen cylinders and thousands of horsepower. Starting such engines by hand cranking was a laborious task. Could the mechanical and automotive Huck starter be the perfect solution for the demands of the war? In reality, it wasn't. The Huck starter required precise alignment between the drive shaft and the aircraft propeller, so the most time-consuming part of the starting operation was adjusting the position of the vehicle and the drive shaft. If the air raid alarm sounded and ground crew members used the Huck starter to start the aircraft, by the time the aircraft successfully started, it might have been riddled with bullet holes from enemy planes. To address the needs of combat situations, fighter aircraft required a faster key. This led to the development of the famous Kaufman starter. Its starting method was quite impressive. A bullet was inserted into the engine and fired, igniting high-speed combustion gases that would start the engine. Although this starting method may sound unsafe, it is actually very safe because the Kaufman starter uses blank cartridges, so there is no risk of damaging the aircraft. The only problem is that, due to the use of gunpowder gases, the Kaufman starter is not very clean. 
It tends to accumulate carbon deposits and requires frequent cleaning. Additionally, the Kaufman starter is a disposable starter. Although some models can accommodate multiple rounds, it cannot hide the fact that the Kaufman starter requires a one-time use device to start the engine. During regular use and maintenance, ground crew members must constantly replenish the starter's ammunition. So, in addition to the Kaufman starter, designers did not give up exploring other starting methods. During World War II, another key was added to fighter aircraft, and the principle behind it was relatively simple, electric starting. Its principle was similar to the Huck starter, as it used one engine to drive the main engine. However, instead of using a larger automotive engine, this time a smaller electric motor was used. The designers placed the electric starter inside the engine compartment and used its rotation to ignite the engine. This method was already quite similar to that of modern cars. The difference was that the aircraft engine compartment had limited space and couldn't accommodate a high voltage battery that would provide enough power for the starter to work. The simple solution was to place the battery outside the aircraft and let ground crew members manage it. As time progressed, jet engines were introduced to fighter aircraft. Even at this stage, they still relied on an external starting key, but this time it transitioned from a battery to an air turbine starter. We all know that jet engines rely on the combustion of fuel in the combustion chamber, which generates thrust to propel the aircraft. One important element for combustion is having sufficient airflow. So, what happens when a jet engine is completely shut down and doesn't receive enough air? You find a device to blow air into it, and that's where the air turbine starter and ground air source vehicle come into play. Ground crew members use the ground air source vehicle to blow air into the air turbine starter, which in turn drives the engine rotor by passing air through it, achieving the required ignition speed and airflow. However, the downside of this method is that during a cold start on the ground, the engine must rely on the ground air source vehicle. This situation raised a problem. Fighter aircraft were manageable, usually with one or at most two engines, and cold starts during wartime were not excessively slow. However, for some large aircraft, even if the ground air source vehicles were working tirelessly, they couldn't get them airborne quickly. This was the case with the B-52 strategic bomber, which had a total of eight engines. One ground air source vehicle could start one engine at a time, and starting all eight engines would take nearly an hour. As the platform for the U.S. Triad nuclear strike, an hour of startup time was enough for the Soviet nuclear bomb to turn the B-52 and its ground air source vehicles into ashes. Therefore, the B-52 also adopted an unconventional Kaufman starter. The most noticeable difference was that, since a turbofan engine requires ignition and needs to reach a sufficient speed, the energy required to achieve the necessary speed of the fan blades was greater than for starting a piston engine. So, the B-52 starter did not use a blank cartridge, instead, it used a special specification of explosive charge. The explosion of the explosive charge's gunpowder gas replaced the ground air source vehicle, enabling the B-52 to take off quickly. The B-52 still employs this method of takeoff today. Amidst the dilemma of requiring ground-based air source vehicles and explosive charges for startup, fighter aircraft themselves underwent another upgrade to enhance their autonomy. This time, their starting key was no longer placed outside the aircraft but integrated internally. This starting key is called an APU, which stands for Auxiliary Power Unit. Its introduction was the result of several factors combined. Firstly, in intense combat situations, ground-based air source vehicles may not be readily available, and explosive charge startup is limited by a series of design factors. Therefore, to eliminate this dilemma, an APU is typically a small gas turbine engine or a few of them. It operates on aviation fuel and provides powerful power. When it is operational, it ignites the main engines of the fighter aircraft while avoiding the need for redundant systems. Another issue is that although modern fighter jets have enough space to accommodate batteries for onboard equipment power, the increasing number of avionics systems has turned modern fighter jets into power-hungry machines. The battery power alone is insufficient. If the aircraft were to rely on an internal battery for startup, it would consume a significant amount of power.
In the event of an emergency situation, if the battery were depleted, the aircraft would instantly lose situational awareness, putting it in a highly dangerous position. Therefore, in the past, when aircraft started on the ground, power and air supply vehicles were typically used together. However, with the introduction of the APU, ground crew members can use ground power to start the APU, which then supplies power to the aircraft. The ground power can then be removed, and the aircraft can gain independent capability within seconds. The pilot can then use the APU to start the engines, avoiding battery power loss. Moreover, during emergency takeoffs in wartime, the power consumption of starting the APU with the onboard battery is much lower than the imagined consumption of starting the engines directly with the onboard battery. This indirectly improves the endurance of the aircraft's batteries. At this stage, the APU has become a standard feature in fighter jets. Various models of fighter jets, including the F-22 and F-35 of the United States, have their own APUs. This significantly enhances the aircraft's independent operational capability and reduces reliance on forward bases. But at this point, does the aircraft still have a key in the sense of locking? In reality, due to the uniqueness of military airports, the guards stationed near military airports and the weapons they carry are the best keys to the aircraft. Even if you could bypass the guards and enter the hangar, it would be very difficult to start the engines without ground crew, air supply vehicles, or power vehicles. The situation where the pilot doubles as ground crew and both the power and air supply vehicles are available, as depicted in the movie Top Gun, Maverick, is just reasonable fiction in movies. However, although previously designed and manufactured aircraft did not have keys in the sense of locking, it does not mean that modern aircraft designs and manufacturing lack keys. For example, the F-35 may not have a physical key, but it has an electronic key. This key is the flight control system encryption key for the F-35. After the F-35 is powered on, as a zero display fighter with all digital screens, it displays a startup interface. Similar to setting a password on a computer, the pilot must enter the correct username and password to access the F-35's flight control system and complete a series of pre-flight checks. If in Top Gun, Maverick, Tom Cruise found an F-35 in the hangar instead of an F-14, the two without the password would probably have a hard time getting back home. Furthermore, in addition to this electronic key, the F-35 is more advanced compared to other jet fighters in that it has eliminated the cumbersome series of cold start checks. With the support of a brand new avionics system, the engine startup of the F-35 is as simple as starting a modern car with a one-button start mode. The pilot just needs to press the start button, and the aircraft will perform a series of cold start operations, igniting the engines by itself. This operation is undoubtedly very convenient. Perhaps, with the development of technology, fighter jets might soon have Touch ID or Face ID unlocking and starting the aircraft with a fingerprint or face scan might become a reality. At that time, fighter jets and cars would seem quite similar, wouldn't they?